The large majority of us are in autopilot all day long. We wake up and we don't really consider the choices that we're making through the day. The more consciously present we are, the more we have choice. We can begin to create new habits and patterns in this moment. I believe yeah. that what we're seeking can only be found inside of us. Need motivation? Watch your top 10! With Believe Nation! Top 10, I got a top 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. Top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. And men. All my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Nicole LaPera, and my take on her top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, observe yourself. Our minds seek the familiar. Repeating the same behaviors is called a pattern, which comes from childhood conditioning. We repeat what we know. So I kind of want to just start from the beginning. If that is true, how do we start to identify what patterns we have developed from childhood that are not serving us? Yeah, absolutely. I actually got chills <laughs> hearing you reread that just because of how powerful that just statement is. And then I think when I answer the question, experiencing that statement is incredibly powerful. So what do I mean by that? Observing, observing yourself. So I can sit here and say, you know, we're patterned, we repeat everything from our lifestyle habits, you know, the things we do first thing in the morning, how we go about our day. Um, I could tell you, you repeat thoughts that we get very repetitive. Um, we tend to tell ourselves the same narrative in our head, most of us, all day long. A lot of us now are really familiar with the phenomenon of thoughts producing emotional reactions in the body. I think most of us, I know myself, I've sat on a couch, had an anxiety provoking thought, you know, worried about something happening, typically something not positive happening. And I myself at least have thrown my body into a complete reaction. I would start to feel panicked. So a lot of us are repeating the same emotional experiences too. And the way we identify that is we watch ourselves, observe yourself. The large majority of us are in autopilot all day long. We wake up and we don't really consider the choices that we're making through the day. That part of our brain, those of you who are familiar with my work probably hear me go on and on about the subconscious. That's where those patterns are stored. So when we wake up, pay attention to how many choices you're making for yourself that day or is your autopilot determining your day to day? And chances are you are conditioned. You are repeating those same patterns, even if you intend to do differently. Rule number two, create new choices. We shame ourselves as yeah. humans because if we have that old reaction or assign that old meaning, immediately we become shameful. Oh, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't. It doesn't matter. I mean, we're gonna have those thoughts. They're gonna stick around for a mm -hmm. while. We're gonna have those feelings even. They're gonna stick around for a while, but we can start to create new choices yes. and we don't have to feel badly you know, about desiring to live those old familiar patterns. It's mm -hmm. actually part of being human. Rule number three, be consciously present. For our entry into our conscious mind, we can use the present moment through one of two hooks. Our breath, we're always breathing. So if we can learn how to flex that muscle of attention and put our full focus onto the act of our breathing body, we become embodied. Now I'm in my body and I'm present to what's in front of me. Another hook we can use is our senses. The senses, what are we seeing? What are we tasting? Can we touch something? Anything that we can do that's senses-based can also be our access point to conscious awareness. The more consciously present we are, the more we have choice. We can begin to create new habits and patterns in this moment. Rule number four, stop self-judgment. The judgment part, I think, is the piece, Lisa, that we all struggle with. Um, I kind of universally speak of a critical voice in our head because I quite literally think quite universally, we all have that. We all sit in judgment of ourselves. I'm better than you, I'm worse than you, good, bad. All of those words come from that ego space. So it's a skill, it's a practice. And 
it's going to be difficult. If you, especially if you know you're someone with that inner critical voice, you probably, your habit is going to be to sit in judgment. So I just like to voice these things because I know a lot of us can become very self-judgmental when it doesn't come naturally to us or when we do see those judgments being cast. So we want to practice just viewing them as they are. And I talk about the childhood and the wounding and the effective conditioning because I think a lot of us do judge ourselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have maybe been through a lot of therapy, have been through a lot of self-help, might even consider ourselves really insightful. We might essentially know better, but yet we can't execute the choices to quote unquote do better, if you will. Um, and then we start to assign judgments on ourselves. I'm broken. I'm not meant to change. I can't get better. This isn't the life meant for me. And really the list goes on. So learning, I think, how to shift that, um, learning how to just view things objectively as they are and understanding if you are someone who's stuck in that conditioning, that it's not actually a sign of something being wrong with you. It's a sign that your subconscious is functioning as all of ours do to keep you safe, to keep you in that familiar place. Also, if you want to have more confidence, self-love, self-belief, check out my 254 series. The sign says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action to build a habit. So I've designed a special free program to help you get it, where I will send you an unlisted video to your email for the next 254 days to shift your self-belief forward. The link to sign up for free is in the description below. I was reminded this morning of a question I'm often asked. How do you eliminate fear from your life? Successful people do what they hate to get to where they want to be. Self-love is not an indulgence. It's not a nice to have. It is a prerequisite. Rule number five, acknowledge wholeness. What I came to realize is that I wasn't really helping people. Um, right. that I was still struggling myself. Right. Um, for me, the name of the game was anxiety. As long as I can remember, I'm someone, I was a little girl, scared of the world, hiding under tables, any thump in the night. I mean, I was assuming it was the worst case thing, the robber, you know, the thing that's wow. going to hurt me. So as long as I can remember, I was very, you know, aware of the kind of struggles that I think a lot of us have. And I went down the very traditional pathways to try and heal myself. Mm -hmm. I was on medication, I did talk therapy, and it kind of was just always there. And I wasn't really getting better. And what I started to see week after week with clients once I opened up my practice was a lot of the similar patterns. Mm -hmm. it, in amazing amounts of awareness. I mean, people coming in week after week with these breakthroughs, these aha moments, knowing exactly what I want to do differently the next time this thing happens to, you know, break that pattern, whatever it may be. And then yet that person would come in that next week with kind of a repetition of the same, you know, oh, I engaged in that same pattern, you know, I drank, I fought with my partner, what have you. Right. So I really was seeking to understand what is going on. Why can't any of us maintain changes and myself include it? Right. And then what I came to realize um, through, you know, an evolution, my own dark night of the soul, hitting bottom, you know, really questioning myself, my life, my purpose, you know, my own lack of fulfillment, you know, here, you know, in this earth experience. And what I came to realize is that I wasn't really, I didn't, I wasn't working with the whole human. Um, coming from a traditional system where it's kind of very much the medical model, yeah. right? When our body is sick, you go to the body doctor. When your mind is sick, you go to me, right. I'm the mind doctor. And those things are very separate. And nowhere was anything talked about in terms of spirituality, a soul, something else. So what I came to realize is that separation was why a lot of us were really stuck. It's because we were operating with imbalances in one or more of those areas, in my physical body, maybe yeah. in my emotional self or my spiritual self. And that's why I wasn't actually creating change. So that's what holistic now means to me. Right. It means understanding that we are interconnected human. We have these, to, um, I talk really simplistically, we have these parts, if you right. will, no, no, we have this good. physical Please body simply, yeah. uh, and all that comes along with our physical needs. We have an emotional body. We have energies and hormones that run through us that give us our feelings, our emotions, and they're very complicated. Right. And I think a lot of us now are waking up to a reality that there might be something else. There, you know, whether or not you want to call it something spiritual or a soul, I think a lot of us are starting to search for that essence, that like something else. Yeah. And so that's what holistic means to me is acknowledging the wholeness of yeah. us and then seeking to understand what's driving our stuckness. Because I'm of the belief 
that yeah. it is an imbalance, like I said, in one of those areas that's keeping us repeating the pattern. Rule number six, practice saying no. How do we say no without an excuse or an apology then? Yeah, practice. I mean, it's hard, you know, it's very, very difficult. First and foremost, yeah. it's accepting the reality that you're, you have every, you're welcome to say no. You're allowed to say no. And that nice. saying no doesn't diminish who you are or the relationship. Again, this is a deeper, this is an evolution of work. We don't just turn off, you know, the, the belief that I have to say no to maintain these friendships. We don't just overnight come by a new belief, right? right? right. So we can practice. And I suggest practicing I say like around the periphery, right? Start to say no. So what this looked like for me, I started to put up boundaries or to say my no's in my professional world where it felt a little easier, right? So some requests that would come in and from people that I maybe didn't really know, it would mm -hmm. feel, and it's virtual, so I can even right. send the email, throw my phone, which has happened before, and run away and come back later to yeah. see what happened. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't you know? react. You know what I mean? So easier for me. So I, I practice there before I practice maybe saying no with my immediate family or uh -huh. with my partner. Uh -huh. There's gonna be some, there might be some relationships that are, it might be even easier. Maybe you do have that one friend that is like casual about cool, it. Yeah. You know, you're gonna find the moments of practice, but the theme for today, you have to practice. Yeah. Because it's gonna be really hard when you're faced with that saying that no. And what's gonna happen is everything that happens in your mind that prevented you from saying that no for however many years you have not said that no, it's gonna happen in your mind. The second you, well, first of all, before you say the no, trying to convince you out of saying the no. Mm. So before you know it, you're saying yes again. I know. Right, this is where consciously well, please, you have to, yeah. no, you have to say no, no, period, the end, or no, whatever yeah. you wanna deliver deliver the message being. And then on the back side, once it's delivered, your mind is gonna try to convince you out of that no still. Yeah. Oh, you're terrible. Oh, this person is gonna hate you. Oh, it's been two hours since they responded. Clearly this relationship is over, right? Now the work is still on you. Don't spend time in that thought. Just like we were talking about earlier. Um, Get the hell yeah, yeah, out yeah, of yeah. there. Of course. But don't expect it not to be there. I call them the feel bads. The feel uh -huh. bads have haunted me around every boundary I've set it set for quite a long time before they've diminished. And they still are there every now and again. I still find myself feeling bad, almost into saying yes. Maybe I'm even feeling bad once I've said the no, but I'm like carrying that. But I get to choose, how long do I wanna live in this feel bad? It's not good, yeah. And a, a really cool thing happens as you practice, you start to learn and see, sometimes you do get that feared response. Sometimes exactly what you imagine would happen that's not positive does. I got that a lot from my family. Not all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you focus on the moments where the thing that you feared most didn't happen, that relationship didn't end, those friends still were around and asked you to come to the movies next weekend, right. that's what I urge you to pay attention to. Because that's gonna help you keep saying the no's and helping yeah. you shift out of the pattern. Rule number seven, learn to deep breathe. By the time I started feigning, Tom, I, I actually I didn't know what was wrong with me at that point because the symptoms seemed so physical and seemed so brain-based. I was scared, if I was honest. I wouldn't have imagined that as I dove down and began to peel back the onion and unpack all of this, that this was related to overwhelming emotions in childhood. That was not my first path of exploration. My first path of exploration was what is wrong with me? Um, by that time, just kind of going back on the physical side of things for me, I had had headaches my whole life. I had had brain fog or kind of that, that fogginess, not really feeling like my brain was awake all of the time my whole life. Out of nowhere, as I entered into my 30s, I started to forget my words mid-sentence. Memory issues that I always kind of had now seemed, I seemed to have a really hard time even remembering things that happened last week, for instance. And then out of the blue, I started fainting. So of course I was like, this must be something wrong with my brain. What is it? And when I dove into research, I then met all of this you know, work on epigenetics and the effect that our daily choices and or events that happen to us have on our physical bodies. Diving in deeper, I really understood my nervous system. And now I understood my fainting as the, the effects of accumulated years of living in that dysregulated nervous system. So now that I understood what the cause of it was, which goes into my definition of holistic. Holistic for me not only means honoring our mind, our body, and our soul, the interconnectedness of our being, it also means exploring what for many of us are the deeper underlying imbalances that are causing what we're calling symptoms or even diagnoses or syndromes, right? So now that I understood, oh, for me, this fainting could be a symptom of something deeper could be a symptom of how I'm treating my body 
and how dysregulated my nervous system is. So as I began to dive into this research, I noticed something else, how disconnected I was to my body. So once I build the foundation of consciousness that we just talked about, once I began to teach myself how to safely inhabit my body, I began to do some nervous system regulation techniques and tools. The quickest and easiest one that we all carry around with us is around breath work. And I started to tune into how was I breathing? Just checking in with my natural flow of breath. And I realized that like many people who struggle with anxiety, I had a really shallow chest breath. I noticed that sometimes, Tom, when I'm really stressed out, I hold my breath. I actually don't really breathe much at all. And what I learned is each time I do both of those things, either just breathe really shallowly or I'm holding my breath, I'm actually contributing to my anxiety because I'm keeping my nervous system locked in that fight or flight mode. So I learned a new way to breathe. I learned how to use my belly, which was hard at first because all of my posture was reflective of all of this constriction and all of this threatening kind of posture and stance of a lifetime. So once I accessed my belly, I learned that I could learn how to bring, teach my body. Can you walk people through how you did that? Because um, belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing changed my life. So I'd be curious to know what tools you use for that. Yeah. So for a lot of us um, who struggle with our posture, it's hard. Um, I, so back, was, straight shoulders, back. So I started laying down. It was difficult for me. So I would begin my practice either right before bed or right when I woke up, when I was already laying. And for me, it started with just a small daily promise of five breaths from my deep belly area. For me, putting my hand on my belly physically so I could feel it um, when it would expand and when it would deflate was really helpful. So that was just a daily promise. Every time, every morning or right before bed, I would put my hand on my belly and just practice, practice, practice. But then, like I said, I wanted to become more aware of how I was using my breath all day long. And then building on that foundation, can I harness my breath all day long when now life's happening and I have the actual things to be stressed out about, right? Can I use my breath to regulate myself in those moments? So it becomes a foundational practice that we can build upon. Rule number eight, focus inward. I believe yeah. that what we're seeking can only be found inside of us. Um, this is exact, and that's where it gets so really profound. This is yeah. where, so this is why I'm kind of insistent on inward, mm. be, you know, because as, and I'm still learning emotionally because I was so dissociated. It's still taking me a long time to to yeah. be in body, to feel my feelings, to differentiate between what is this feeling. I don't even know what to call it, let yeah. alone what to do with it. So you know, in a lot of ways, I'm I'm still you know finding how yeah. to meet my needs. I'm still finding how to be, you know, the spiritual being and just speak my truth regardless of, you know, how people are hearing it or reacting to it. Um, so that's, that's in my opinion, the life work is all of us are on the journey mm -hmm. to meet our own needs. Now, again, this doesn't mean at the exclusion of others. I believe that the pathway to be fully authentically connected with others, because we are interpersonal beings, humans are wired to connect, we need other humans. Yeah. However, so many of us are operating on patterns where we're trying to get needs met through other people, that we have to focus inward first, we have to be able to fulfill ourselves, meet our own needs authentically, before I can then authentically present them to another person in a relationship. Rule number nine, honor your intuition. I wake up and there's a difference between mornings where I just like, it is that old resistance. I just kind of like, don't feel like it, though I can activate and make the choice against that otherwise. And then there are different mornings where my body doesn't feel like it. I'm emotionally exhausted. Mm. In those circumstances, I do urge the individual to honor their intuition or their inner knowing, the part of their body that's saying, you know what? That new choice isn't for me today. I'm actually going to surrender into maybe what my body needs today. And it's not getting up at 5 a.m. and going to the gym. Maybe this morning I do something different. Mm. That's the end product goal, though, is to get so in touch with ourself to learn often, as I still do myself through trial and error, to learn what my body and my emotional and my energy signals are to know and be able to differentiate whether or not it is that resistance. And this is a moment where if I actualize this new choice, right, I can keep myself moving in that future self direction. Or if this is a moment where, you know what, 
I'm going to honor my body or my emotions right now and make the choice that my need is telling me in that moment. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is don't create overwhelm. We create another situation of overwhelm for ourselves. Those of us who decide that starting tomorrow, my life will be different from top to bottom. And maybe I have five new, 10 new things on my to-do list. I'm diving into that deep end. I'm telling my subconscious that, wow, my life's gonna do a you know, 360, 180 by tomorrow. I'm probably gonna overwhelm. So the way we begin to build and create change, what's important is not five new things for as long as I can white knuckle it. What's important is one new thing from now until forever, that consistency of the habit. So we wanna make a small promise. We're already going to be uncomfortable. I talk about this a lot too, a concept that I call resistance. Because every time we set an intention to change, even if logically you can have, as many of us do, a court case for why I really need to stick to this change this time, right? When I go to either the first time I go to do the new thing, or maybe it's the fifth time that I'm trying to now maintain my habit, it's only a matter of time before one of two things happen. We either get mental resistance in our mind and our thoughts. That could look like the endless to-do list of other things that we should be doing, or maybe the million reasons why this won't work this time, or some of it drops into our bodies where we just start to feel agitated or just different than we normally feel. And before long, one of those two reasons can convince us back into that familiar rut. Before long, I go back to being as I normally am. So the way we wanna create and maintain change is acknowledge that discomfort is part of changing. It's part of doing something new. It's that unfamiliar space that my subconscious likes to avoid. We can even reframe it. It signs that I'm moving in a direction of difference. How great. So don't expect it not to be there. And then we learn to work with it. We integrate it in a sense by making one small promise and we focus on keeping it. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what is your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of actually doing something and following through. That Belief Nation is not enough. 35% is not enough, we gotta do something. But when you get inspired by watching a video like this and then you create a plan of action, your chances of following through jump to 91%. And when you commit publicly, like putting your comment down below with your plan, it jumps to 95%. That's what I want for you. I want you to take action. Your dreams are too important. Your life matters. Your mission has to happen. So question of the day, your biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week, put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna celebrate alongside with you. The first way, and this kind of ties into something you were saying earlier, the first way that we can start to quiet our mind is we don't battle our thoughts away. We can't obviously hit the mute button on them, but we can start to pay less attention by removing mm. our attention. So mm. each and every time I would see that, because my subconscious, our subconscious is, is what's offering most of our thoughts for us, right? So my, my cupcake's gone and oh, my subconscious is gonna assign that. I'm not considered scarcity-based meaning, not my conscious mind, right? So I don't have control over that. That's why I explain that. Subconscious, you don't have control over We do not have control over it. We can, we can- Reprogram it. Reprogram it through consistent repetition of something new. By being aware um, of our thoughts consciously and right. being like, okay, that doesn't support me anymore. Let right. me have yeah. a new thought. So the, way I, the simplest way I put it is to change our subconscious, we first need to start paying less attention to those older narratives that, that are naturally going to be there. And I but say this- You need this, to pay attention to them first to pay less attention. You need attention. to notice them and then remove your attentional focus back to your breath, back to the current moment. Mm -hmm. And that is the tool, the muscle, I call it a mindful, the muscle that we're building, our attentional muscle. We all have one. Ours are, most of ours are just very wimpy because either life that's endlessly distracting is grabbing our attention or a lot of us are spending way too much time looking, if you will, at our thoughts. So mm -hmm. noticing our thoughts enough to then redirect my attention away will weaken that narrative. So that's the first layer of work. Okay. Um. If you want to see the top 10 I did on Lisa Bill, you check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. And I don't say that, like, I think if you choose to be a housewife, it can be the most beautiful thing in your life. But I didn't choose to be. And so when we started on our um, entrepreneurial journey, it was all like, 